In these uncertain times, we sometimes crave familiarity and comfort to get us through and remember that there was life before lockdown. In this series, I chat to Beyond the Title's past subjects about their heroes and how they managed to change the face of entertainment. So join us for an affectionate look back at the remarkable career of an icon of British light entertainment, here on Beyond the Title. Making his television debut on ATV's variety series Comedy Bandbox on the 21st of December 1963, legendary comedian and impressionist Mike Yarwood went from touring working men's clubs around the northeast of England to becoming one of Britain's biggest stars of the 1970s and set the benchmark for TV impressionism in Britain. Appearances on Sunday night at the London Palladium introduced him to the medium of television and in 71 secured his own BBC TV series, Look, It's Mike Yarwood. For over a decade, the Mike Yarwood show reigned supreme over the BBC TV schedules until 1982 when he signed for Thames. Following the Mike Yarwood show special on the 15th of December 1987, his contract with Thames was not renewed. I caught up with my friend and impressionist Steve Nallon to celebrate the life of the man behind a thousand voices. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk Mike Yarwood. Right, Steve, welcome back to Beyond the Title for this special podcast about someone who we both admire. First question though, can you remember the first time you saw Mike Yarwood on TV and what was it about him that inspired you? Um, I think the first time would have been during one of the election campaigns of 1974. So at the beginning of 74, Ted Heath was in power, but by the end, Harold Wilson was in power and, and he did both of them. And I don't know whether this was the first time I saw him on television, but I have a strong memory during one of the election campaigns, um, uh, it, it, Mike Yarwood was seen uh, in a, doing an after dinner speech live on television. And the rules were you couldn't obviously make fun of politicians during an election campaign. Um, but he did the voices. It very, very briefly did a little sn- He did a little snippet of Harold Wilson. And he did a little snippet of Ted Heath. Uh, um, so that was my memory. Uh, that was my very earliest memory of him. And uh, nobody had ever done that before. Um, and uh, it was really exciting because it was an unheard of thing. He, I, I think I read this somewhere that he appeared um, in, in a theatre show, whether it was the Palladium or not, I can't remember. Uh, and the, the host I th- uh, was Norman Vaughan. And, and I remember that. And Norman Vaughan uh, introduced him saying, well, now we have a new talent, uh, the impressionist Mike Yarwood, and he's going to impersonate the Prime Minister as if this was, you know, a really, really big deal, which in the 70s or the early 70s, late 60s, it, it really was a, a, a big deal. Um, and, um, and I was, and I could do voices. Um, I, uh, uh, my earliest voices were cartoon characters, really, you know, Popeye and Olive and things like that. And, and I also bizarrely did Louis Armstrong. Um, singing hello dally well hello dally and i would have been about i suppose nine or ten um so that would put it around about 1970 so i was interested in voices so obviously when i saw somebody on television impersonating people i i sort of gravitated towards them um do you think it's fair to say that uh, Yawa didn't follow a normal variety route into showbiz? Um, what effect do you think that had over his early career? Well, I know he performed at the Embassy Club in Manchester, which was Bernard Manning's Embassy Club. Um, and I remember that reading about that in his autobiography. And, and Bernard Manning has also sort of said, I think he was on 25 quid a night or something. Um, but uh, Mike Yarwood was one of those uh, characters that, w- that anybody could see was clearly destined for television um, because of his unique talent. And he was fast tracked, I think, essentially into into television. I don't remember him appearing on anybody else's television show. Perhaps he did or he might have appeared in a, in a sort of live theatre show that were, you know, was televised. Um, but certainly by... Uh, 74, 75, he was on television. You know, he had his own show on television, one of the most popular shows on television. And he would have been, I suppose, in, in, what, in his late 20s, something like that, early 30s, quite soon. 
So tell us a little bit about Three of a Kind, which you did with Lulu. Um, well, who was the other one? Because I can't remember who the other one was. If it was Lulu, Mike Yarwood, and, and who else would it have been? Yeah. Josh doesn't know either. No, right. Um, I can't tell you. I mean, Lulu, the, everybody in those days, light entertainment was, um, uh, it's now called shiny floor television because of, you know, things like Strictly Come Dancing. Um, but in the old days, it used to be infinity psych television. And basically what you would have this, this big studio with this white curtain uh, or white psych, it's, it's made of material, right at the back of the studio and then a white floor. And it gives you this sense of infinity. You never got a sense of... Um, uh, it, it, it actually coming to an end. It was unique to television. It's, it, sadly, it's gone now. And um, yeah, he appeared on those sort of shows, I think, with Lulu and probably Anita Harris and, and that, you know, that, those singers from the, from the 70s. I think it was Ray Fell in Three of a Kind. Right. Well, you've, you've, you've got me on that. I can't, I, I can't tell you. Um, well, uh, will the real Mike Yarwood stand up and the real Mike Yarwood were broadcast on ITV during the late 60s? In what ways did this... Oh, well, I've got that completely wrong then. I don't remember those at all. Oh. Ah. They might well have been um, on After My Bedtime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so his work in the 60s, Josh sort of asked, how do you think that... Um, prepared him for his dominance later on at the BBC, you know, 60s. Well, I, I don't, I, I mean, you know, I don't really remember him in, 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 in the, the, the 60s doing, doing uh, those shows. I have heard of them, actually, because I've, I've read um, Mark Yarwood's uh, autobiography. I read that many, many years ago. I don't think I've still got a copy of it now, but I read it years ago. Um, so I, I have heard of those shows, but I didn't know they were as early as the 60s. So I suppose he would have been doing Matt Millen in, in those days. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Josh uh, asked, in 1971, he rejoined the BBC, first on Look Mike Yarwood and Mike Yarwood in Persons. Um, how do you feel these were a perfect platform to showcase his talents? Um. Well, the thing about Mike was, I saw him on stage a couple of times um, uh, in the 70s, and he was a good performer, but he wasn't a natural performer on stage. Um, he was a slightly, you could see he was slightly uncomfortable with, with being in a, in a theatre, um, and, um, and a little uneasy, uh, you know, a little uneasy about it. Um, and I later discovered he was just very, very nervous. Um, he, you know, he was a very nervous, nervous guy. And I think that with television, his talent could um, really shine. Um, you know, he could do retakes if he wanted to. And he was a, 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 one of those tight performers. Ken Dodd, for example, big performer, wonderful on stage. You put him on television and the television really couldn't contain him. Whereas Mike Yarwood, a, a, a much smaller, physically a much sort of a smaller sort of guy, um, a sort of a, more of an ordinary sort of guy as well. Um, and um, that was he had the perfect personality for television and i don't mean that in any you know any un unpleasant way he he, he 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 was the right size of a performer for for television and of course vocally the microphone could get really close and and pick up the, the you know the, the the real accuracy of the voices <laughs> Josh said that was a bit like Benny Hill. I think that's true. Um, Benny Hill, of course, comes from a, 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 the physical comedy uh, tradition, but it's very visual in a small way. It's like a little comic strip. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's like, like a series of postcards that fitted 
you know the, the, the television very well those visual jokes that that um that benny hill used to have probably wouldn't have worked terribly well on a film uh in a movie but on television um you know the the, the, the same size as a postcard and 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 uh he's a Little grin was again perfect for perfect for um, for television. Um, what was very good as well for television with Mike Yarwood was the camera could cut um, on the change of the voice. So what we, what he would do, uh, particularly at the end of his show, he always did this at the end of his shows was 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 a routine of a, probably about ten or maybe twelve, fifteen voices, and every time he changed his voice, the camera would slightly come at a different angle. Um, and uh, th again, that was just a, a perfect medium for the talent that he had. Uh, and I always remember how brilliant he was at uh, the Steptoes, Steptoe and Son. And, you know, and, and he would put the, the, the face on with the old man, which was sort of very gurney without any teeth. different face for Steptoe but each time the camera just cut slightly so the, the the medium of television served him incredibly well it also meant that for things such as doing impersonations of um, Harold Wilson and Ted Heath they were only ever seen on television sat behind a desk um, that was a part of political broadcast in the 1970s. So, um, you know, we didn't have films with part of political broadcast in those days. Nobody went outside and made a movie out of them. So it's basically one guy sat behind a, a nice posh desk. Um, and Yarwood was able to copy that, or imitate that perfectly because he was, you know, a prime minister known for appearing on, on television behind a desk. And there was Yarwood dressed as the prime minister in you know good makeup and all the rest of it also behind the desk so in those days parliament wasn't uh broadcast at all neither on radio or, or or on television so um it was you know that we saw the prime minister of the day often as not behind a desk which again it, it was perfect to you know, to recreate that in his television shows and uh, at the end of each show, he would re-enter the studio as himself before ending on the song, And This Is Me. How yeah. important do you think that was for the audience to see the man behind the mask? Well, he, he, you actually saw how different he was to all the characters he did. I mean, that was it. When he, and, uh, 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 he was such an, un, it was, he's a very unassuming man when you met him. Uh, very gentle. Uh, he, he never raised his voice um, and he, you know he shone when he became other people um, and he all, very rarely in his show did he ever speak as himself during it occasionally he would say something like that we were thinking the other day what it might be like if Eddie Waring for example were And you cut away to Eddie Waring in his commentary box watching the Royal Ballet. You never saw the Royal, you know, just Eddie Waring. Oh, well, 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 there we have it, taking on up and under there with the little legs going high in the air. And, and you know, he would, he would turn the Royal Ballet into a, into a, a rugby league match. Um, but you'd very rarely get Yarwood as Yarwood at all. Uh, it was almost as if he just didn't want to do it. Yeah. Um, so when, just would like to ask when you met him for the first time and if he offered you any advice? Well, I, I was about 25 when I met him. Uh, he was at Thames by then. He'd left the BBC and uh, he very kindly invited me to, to uh, appear on his show which was a big in those days for in Thames uh, 1985 uh, it, it was a midweek show uh, so I think it was on a what have been what Wednesday or something Wednesday or Thursday uh, it was the same slot that uh, Benny Hill had um, so it was an hour show a lot of it was 
pre-recorded. What the, what he basic what basically happened to to Mike was that the BBC did everything live in the studio with an audience. And if you work at the BBC, you basically have two two and a half hours to record the show. So you work all day on the show. You do a dress rehearsal, run through in the afternoon. You then have your supper break. You start about seven or half past, and filming has to stop at ten. So you so no matter whatever show you do live, it has to be within that two and a half hour slot. So if Mike Yarwood was doing five or six characters in the full outfit with makeup and, and wigs, that was a really, really tough two and a half hours for him. Um, and, and also there, was, there wasn't always an auto cue in those days either. So he had to learn the, the, the sketches. And most of them were in front of the audience. Benny Hill never did anything really in front of the audience, very rarely. But this was actually in front of the audience. And... And Mike really found it a strain, uh, you know, running around backstage, putting the makeup on. Are we going to get it in in time? I've got one take to do this. Will we be able to finish it by 10? Um, the advantage of that was that you've got a live audience watching him and he was able to react and perform. But when he went over to Thames, um, Thames basically said to him, uh, we, we don't have to worry too much about all that you know live stuff in front of an audience no 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 we, we, we'll we'll pre-record everything we'll pre-record everything in the studio and just play the sketches back to the live audience and uh, and then they'll laugh at the pre-record and uh when we were working together he said to me oh there's a laugh there steve you've got to say 1000 2000 i said what do you mean i've got to say 1000 2000 no 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 you don't say it in your head so you say and that is what will happen to you, Mr. Kinnock. And that is where the laugh will be. That is where they put the laugh. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage of that was that, um, frankly, you, your face would go a bit blank during the, you know, while you were miming 1,000, 2,000. And, and it just wasn't as good. Um, and I think um, his shows at Thames weren't as good. I was thrilled to, to work with him. Um, and um, I remember it was the, the famous black ball game between Dennis Taylor and, and Steve Davis. That's the, that was the night before we worked because I remember staying up till two in the morning thinking I want to watch this but I've got the Mike Yarwood thing to record tomorrow so I can actually date it you know pretty accurately to that to that time he was I mean he was just lovely and again he just walked in I remember we, we, it was about four or five of us um, uh, and I knew the director because the same director who'd, who'd who'd worked on Spitting Image um, and um, I uh, you know and he just walked in and he said um, hello you know and he he was very very unassuming um, so you we rehearsed it as well we rehearsed it in a, a rugby club somewhere near Twickenham I think he lived near there so we, we rehearsed it there um, and and then a few days later I think we had the the studio days at Thames and there was no audience um, he said to me, um, he said, would you like to do some of the sketches? And I wasn't really keen on that, to be honest, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, so I actually appeared in his show as an actor. I appeared as a vicar and a psychiatrist. Uh, I wasn't very good because um, I was not, I didn't really have that much confidence, but he was really, you know, he was really saying, look, do you want an opportunity to, you know, we'll do your Thatcher, that's great, but do you want to play a vicar and do you want to play the psychiatrist and do the sketches? I think I was too young for them, um, really. Um, uh, and I wasn't massively convincing, so I never did it again. But um, he was really, really encouraging. And then he said to me, he said, oh, we've just had an idea, Steve. He was chatting to the director. He said, what we'd like you to do is, um, this is all pre-recorded, but what we want you to do is come to the evening when we will show these sketches in front of the audience, and then I'll bring you on uh, and introduce you as you and we can have a bit of a chat you know in front of the audience and i said that's very kind of you but no um i don't want to do that he said why not i said i don't want to be recognized i don't want people to see really what i look like 
when you know and I, I i don't want that he said steve you're so right forget about it and then he told me a lovely story about working with basil brush and uh it was the end of a peer show he did with basil brush and of course there's no with a way of escaping other than down the pier and every night basil brush used to go out in a you know in a little suitcase and and the guy who did him would say good night mike nobody knew who he was nobody had the slightest idea who he was walked past all the fans and mike said he said yeah he's very good with fans and all the rest of it but he would have maybe 30 or 40 autographs to to sign before he could escape from the pier he said no no you're, you're much better off not not going in that, that direction which i never did so you mentioned I'm meandering, but that's all right, isn't it? <laughs> you mentioned a little bit before about um, his impression of Harold Wilson, um, and in terms of impersonating a British Prime Minister, he was sort of much the first. Really. In what ways do you think that changed satire and how that could be done in Britain? Well, I think that the, the, on television, uh, the, the BBC and, and ITV as well were were very cautious of uh, anything really satirical and that was the week that was um actually it didn't last that long it was a, 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 a spurt of, of satire my theory about satire in the 60s was that the post-war generation of young men and women uh, by the 60s had been let down their hopes of the of a new world um, had, uh, uh, were were let down by the what they saw in the sixties in Vietnam and also some of the corruptions we had there. So there was this sort of um, suddenly f flowering of, of of satire from these people, um, you know, such as the, the David Frosts and even Fluck and Law, who later went on to do Spitting Image and you know the Ned Sherins and all the rest of it. They were sort of angry. And Peter Cook being the prime example, um, and so you'd had that sort of satire, but it, it, satire, but it, it, it was a, it, it wasn't always funny either. It, you know, they actually went for some sort of serious pieces. Mike was somewhere between that and traditional light entertainment and comedy, and um, although he was he did politicians i don't think he'd ever call himself a satirist because he was essentially a a, 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 guy, a guy who wanted to laugh wanted you to laugh you, you know that was his big thing he was he was into um and he was a very gentleman and uh, and i know this because people have told me he'd often get jokes in about people he impersonated uh, such as Bob Monkhouse or Frankie Howard or whoever, and he wouldn't let the jokes happen because he said, "No, I, no, 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 I'm, I'm not saying that about him. He's my friend. I, you know, he's, I like him." And if a joke went too far, as he saw it, was too harsh, he, he wouldn't do it. So he always was on the gentle side of comedy. He'd send people up, obviously, um, but. Uh, he would never be nasty with it uh, and in a way satire depends you actually having uh, a a uh, subversive and you know angry disposition which Mike never had um, as you well know the political and cultural climate is forever changing how difficult do you think it was for Mike to constantly reflect the changing face of popular culture um, well, he was he was just very good at introducing new characters every so often. So he had his Harold Wilsons and his uh, Ted. He said he's. I've just done a play. I play reading it. I didn't do the play when it was performed, but I did the play reading as Ted Heath. He was a cold fish. Was Ted Heath a very cold man? Uh, didn't like women. Didn't seem to like anybody. He had actually very few friends. And the thing about Mike was he made people such as Ted Heath warm and, and almost friendly uh, and he noticed tiny little things about Ted Heath such as the fact that his shoulders would just very gently go up and down as he 
as he laughed and and what might spotted this and would you know oh, oh here we go ho, ho, ho. and the shoulders would go up and down he was absolutely right because i actually met ted Heath, and the shoulders did go up and down when he laughed the, the you know that was that was his thing um and mike was brilliant at at spotting those things and and he sort of made people like that accessible um and then what he spotted was prince charles and he you know he found a way of doing prince charles um the the, the, the sort of way he did that you know the way the mouth gets sort of stretched right across the face and where he says certain words um which i'm not doing very well but but mike did absolutely brilliantly and so every so often he would reinvent himself with a character like prince charles so when uh, when he started doing Harry Wilson and Ted Heath, that was great. Um, but then to suddenly do Prince Charles, which was unheard of, impersonating a member of the royal family. No, you don't do that. You do not do that. And they risked it and went with it. It was a very, very gentle impersonation. Um, and uh, I mean, the famous joke was with, you know, it was breakfast with um, Prince Charles and uh, Diana and the uh, the post arrived and she says um where's the letter opener and he says it's, it's his day off you know it's an, an old joke but a good one um but the thing i want to say really about mike yarwood is that his genius was taking people who weren't funny at all forget politicians and the royal family but take people who weren't funny that appeared on television such as eddie waring and patrick moore and he made them funny so you had these characters who appeared on relatively obscure programs such as The Sky at Night, which was Patrick Moore. And in those days, um, there was, because there was only you know, three channels or two channels if you didn't have BBC Two. Um, everybody watched programs like that. They were always on. I mean, I, as a kid, I remember watching the Welsh language programs at one o'clock, um, uh, having no idea what they were, going, you know, they were on about, but simply because they were on television. Uh, and so... There were all these programs such as the this, 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 this Sky at Night, uh, Rugby League Commentary, that, in, uh, that no matter who you were in the country, if you watched television, you watched those programs. And he would take those characters and turn them into these wonderfully comic creations. And again, nobody else had done that. You know, people had done impersonations of uh, Humphrey Bogart and... and um, uh, and you know the, the the Hollywood movie stars and all the rest of it, but to take somebody who wasn't funny and create an alternative person, it was just brilliant. And that was his real that was his real strength, and that's what made him so funny. And um, so, nineteen eighty two. Now, a somewhat of a controversial move to Thames. Um, have you got an opinion on that? Do you think it was a good move or? I think it was a bad move eventually, um, ultimately. I think it was a bad move ultimately because um, it stopped him having that connection with a live audience. As I said, you know, Thames um, uh, gave him more freedom uh, and gave longer to record, but the shows lacked that spontaneity you get when you're performing in front of a live audience. I mean, my favourite bits of his show in the BBC shows in the, in the late 70s was where he where he had one take to do Jim Callahan, or he had one chance to do uh, Dennis Healy uh, doing a broadcast, and something would go wrong, or the audience would laugh in an odd place, and he went with it. He he wrote it, and you got the one take, and it, it was it had a an energy and a vibrancy about it, and you could see that uh, he was nervous about getting it all, you know, getting getting it right. Um, but he was having fun um, with the audience when, you know, when they when they were reacting to something that, that had happened and it was very spontaneous and, he, you know, he would improvise as well. And all that went when he went to Thames. It, it sort of all disappeared. And he started doing characters like Bob Hope. Well, Bob Hope was, was a man really of the 50s. Um, and uh, wh why was he doing Bob Hope? You know, it's a bit of a mystery to that. He wanted a new characters, but it, it proved difficult for him, I think. So then um, 
moving on to 1987. Oops, sorry about that. Moving on to 1987. Uh, in December, it was an end of an era when the last ever Mike Yarwood show was aired. What impact did that have on TV impressionism as a whole? Well, b b by 1987, Spitting Image had been going for three years. And suddenly what Mike Yarwood was doing, uh, that gentle poking fun at politicians and so on and celebrities, looked incredibly tame. Uh, the, the, you know, the, and the, the, and it was an angry era and uh, Mike Yarwood wasn't an angry man and he didn't fit in that era anymore. And also, and this is uh, public acknowledged by him, uh, he was having uh, personal problems. He had a, you know, he, he, he had a, uh, he was an alcoholic. Um, and um, and I, when, I, when I worked with him, he didn't work in the afternoons. Um, and I was a bit surprised about this. They said, no, no, Mike, Mike doesn't work in the afternoons um, because he goes to the bar. Uh, and again, that was a, a freedom that Thames gave to him, but it wasn't a very wise freedom. Um, but, you know, entertainers often have 10 years. Um, and uh, Mike had probably from, what, 1972, 73, 74, to, you know, the, the early 80s, he had a very, very good run. Um, and then it sort of came to an end because new people had come along. There were also other programs on television. Uh, even in the seventies, there was programs such as who do you do and stuff, but really I think it was spitting image that um, uh, caused a lot of problems for uh, Mike because um, it, it was one, it was incredibly popular and its style fitted the era. And of course, Mike Yarwood did miss his stature, but he only did it once and he didn't do a, he acknowledged this, he didn't do it terribly well. Therefore, that's why he got people such as myself and also Janet Brown. Janet Brown worked with him a lot in the early, um, uh, in the early 80s. He, she did his shows, I think, at, um, at the BBC and um, also at Thames, I think. When a big star retires, there's constantly talk of returns or reunions. Why do you think Mike has always resisted this? I think that from what I understand, and I, I don't know this for absolute certainty, but from what I understand, um, he was very sensible financially. Um, he put money away. Um, he, uh, you know, he may have had a few drinks, but he wasn't a man who bought yachts and you know, expensive the cars and all the rest of it. I think he had a Rolls Royce, but in those days you could do that. People did do that. But, uh, but I think he kept, he, I, I think he had a very sensible um, eye on the future. Um, and I think he also knew that it wouldn't last forever. So when he retired, he could retire. Um, he could stop. In the 90s, I did a show with him where they tried to bring him out of retirement at the BBC and it was going to be called Taking Off with Yarwood. It was a pilot show. Um, Alice Mowen did it, uh, I did it, I think Lewis McLeod did it, um, but it was only ever a pilot and it just didn't work. And I do remember the rehearsals because Mike was chain smoking. He was so, so nervous. And we recorded it in front of the lottery audience. So the, the live show from the lottery, what finished about half past eight, whatever it was, nine o'clock. And then we came on uh, and did the show, but uh, Mike hadn't been on television what for five or six years. Um, people knew who he was, but it just it just wasn't it just really wasn't working for him. Also, when he left television, he did a theatre show, theatre play, and he toured it. Um, well, if you theatre's hard hard work, um, and you really need to be match fit for theatre, and um, uh, Mike had not done a, a theatre show before, a theatre play. And in it, I think he played about 10 or 12 characters. And I remember Brian Ricks telling me that he had done the play, I think, in his 20s. He said, you can't do this play when you're in your late 40s. You just can't do it. You know, you really, it's, it's, it's for a fit young man is that 
character because you're playing so many and that i think came an end came to an end because mike had um just physically couldn't do it so he never did another he never did any acting but i don't think he wanted to to be honest I, you know I, I don't think he particularly massively wanted to he did say occasionally that uh, characters would come along that he thought he could impersonate and he could impersonate um but, but then he lost you know he had no way of putting them on television so you know he did the voices privately but you know and then he's he's hardly done any interviews for the past 30 years um you know 25 years i mean he, he i did i've done a couple of um sort of tributes to him and all the interviews are pre-1995 yeah uh, he people you know he's really he, he he doesn't want to be seen no Bobby Davro still sees him. Uh, Barry Cryer, I, I spoke to the other day. He still sees Mike, um, chatting about old times and happy days and all the rest of it. So um, he, he's not a complete recluse. Um, and John Coleshaw um, uh, has seen him as well. So um, and you look, you know, I've seen some pictures of them all together, and they, they all they all look in, you know, smiling and all the rest of it. And actually, he looks very good. So there we are. So, do you think the comedy landscape would have been any different, looked any different if he hadn't have retired? Um, I think because of Spitting Image, uh, outdoing him in, in its vitriol, um, that sort of very gentle Saturday night television for everybody came to an end in that era. Uh, it also came to an end for the likes of Cannon and Ball and later for Hale and Pace. We simply do not have any more on British television that Saturday night show where you have a comedian or a singer and they bring on their special guest and you have a magician. They, they just don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great shame. Um, and I think M Mike rode that era incredibly well, but but um, it, it's an era that's come to an end for everybody. And you know, it came to an end for Lulu. It came to an end for Cannon and Ball and Hale and Pace. Um, and you you get hints of it now, um, only in the Strictly Come Dancing, where you you know you get a guest singer, but in, in the old days you'd have the Mike Yarwood show and Lulu would be on, you know, singing a song every week, and you 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 and, and of course the two Ronnies um, uh, would would have I can't remember the name of the singer that appeared on the two Ronnies, but it was something like Lin, Lindsay DePaul or somebody. Josh is saying something. Who who was the singer that used to appear on on the two Ronnies? Barbara Dixon. Barbara Dixon. Dixon. That's right. Lynn Paul was somebody else, but yeah, Barbara Dixon um, was was a, um, uh, and there was people of that era like Elkie Brooks as well, um, and they would appear, you know, just to just to give the show a little bit of a change. So you know, and they tended to be male comedians. There were very few comedians uh, uh, on television. So they tended to be male comedians, and they tend to be uh, girl singers such as Lulu or Elkie Brooks or as Josh said, uh, uh, Barbara Dixon. And uh, 1993 did make a little return for the Royal Variety performance. Um, how was it to see him back on stage? Um, I remember that because um, the presenter, the voiceover, had to say who he was doing. And it was a, it just didn't work and it, it was really awkward and uh, uh and i obviously i wasn't there um he made this appearance and he did bob hope i think and steve jones had to say and now impersonating bob hope we have mike yarwood well when you need a voiceover to say who the impersonator is impersonating that is not a good sign. And also we'd had um, 
you know, the, the people like Ross Abbott and Les Dennis and Dustin G had had come along and also taken impressions in a in a sort of you know Coronation Street d d direction. Um, uh, uh, you know what I mean by that? They they found their own characters to impersonate, and he was. Uh, I may be wrong on the Bob Hope, but I don't think I am. He was you know Mike Yarwood impersonating somebody from 40 years ago and where was the new characters and he did say to me and he's had a big effect on my own life actually um he said to me steve he said i can't do people younger than myself anymore he said everybody i do is older than me and um he said i i can't do younger people because it's an it's it's a true it's a true thing when you're 25 and you're impersonating somebody who's when, you, when you're 25 and you're impersonating somebody who's 50 that's funny when you're 50 and impersonating somebody who's 25 uh, that ain't funny and uh, and i spoke to rory bremner um who did anton deck and it was a bit of it didn't work and he acknowledged it didn't work and i told him what mike had said to him uh to said to me and he said steve mike you know absolutely right you know, when you get to a certain age, you've got the grey hairs, you can't do mm. the Anton decks of this world. Mm. Um, and uh, and therefore, you've got to accept that your time as an impersonator has come to an end, uh, as I have accepted that as well. I don't perform anymore, uh, not as an impressionist, um, because I don't have the... Uh, one... I, I did some shows uh, a couple of years back and I quite enjoyed them. I did Preston University on a Friday night. That was a tough gig, but I won them over. And I found that what was happening was that I had to win them over before they started to enjoy the show. And therefore it was a struggle. Um, and yes, I won them over, but I, it, it was hard work. And I had to, as it were, defeat their expectations as to why this, this older man uh, with grey hairs, and of course the audience at Preston University on the Friday night were, you know, young people, why this man had come on stage to entertain us. And, uh, and also, I, I, I think you lose the knack of impersonating new voices. I don't know how, it, why or how it happens, I don't know, but you get to a certain age and you don't do, you no longer do new impressions. I tried doing the Family Guy voices, um, and I did them okay, but there were so many people on the internet doing these voices so much better than than I did, and I really had to work to get even you know close to them. And I thought, no, this it's it's time to leave. And I think Mike Yarwood did something similar, and was happy to do so. You know, he was happy to retire. He had a, a great career, and been very influential. Yeah, you, know, you talk to people like Bobby Davro. Uh, and uh, we owe we owe all of us, my, including Spitting Image, owes um, the 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 breakthroughs that that Mike did and the influences that he had. So, um, last question then is, what is Yarwood's legacy on TV comedy? I think it's the the great ability to take somebody obscure. Um, that's known in the sense that you know that, that it is not completely unknown but relatively obscure and completely reinvent them as a comic character uh, and then you see in the um, in the character um, a, a a truth that you never saw before and i think that was always the case with the patrick moores that he did the the eddie Warings, um and also what he was very good at was creating alternate realities for people um dennis healy was one of his best impressions in the way it wasn't actually his most accurate but it was you could argue it was his best because he took this relatively obscure uh, man who was a bit of a thug in the Labour Party. I could tell you some stories about him, but I won't. Um, he and turned him into this sort of avuncular character with big eyebrows. Nobody had really noticed his Dennis Healy's eyebrows before, but 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 Mike did, and he he had them you know blown up, and 
And he did have this little friendly little voice that he used to do. And he, he created this catchphrase, what a silly Billy. And from then on, everybody who impersonated my, uh, Dennis Feely would say, what a silly Billy. Dennis Feely never said that. Mike, Mike came up with it. Um, uh, he was just very, very inventive from, from that point of view, creating these alternate, uh, alternate characters. Um, and um, yeah. And, and that's a, a great legacy to in you know, the history of light entertainment. Excellent. Well, you have a great way. Josh said that's a great way to end it. And um, yeah, thanks very much for coming on, Steve. And that's right. To and uh, Josh, what was what was your memories of when did you start watching Mike Yarwood, or is it or is he sort of before your time? Yeah. Josh says a bit before his time, the first thing he re first I remember seeing him was on the nineteen ninety three Royal Variety performance. And have I got that right about what happened to him? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It was. It it was. Uh, it 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 was sort of the end of an era um, when he did that show because it it, um, uh, and, and and actually I worked with him in a way afterwards um, because um, Esther Ranson did a show called Esther, and she would sometimes get sort of celebrities who were plugging books or whatever, and and she'd do a show. And uh, this would have been round about 1994-95 and Mike Yow had agreed to come on it um, and uh, I was invited to, to make a contribution as was Janet Brown uh, because we'd both played Thatcher. Now I'd actually met Janet Brown in a theatre and I'd gone up to her and said hello my name's Steve and uh, Stephen Allen, and, and it's lovely to meet you. And she was so lovely, so that when we met, um, we shared a dressing room. <laughs> it was me, 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 and Janet Brown in the dressing room, um, <laughs> both talking, both talking you know, about Mrs. Thatcher um, uh, and our appearances um, as Mrs. Thatcher with um, Mike, and how generous he had been, and how helpful, and all the rest of it. So me and Janet got on incredibly well. Um, um, but that show was really uh, him talking about his, um, uh, it's a bit like with a, one of those Opera Winfrey shows where he, he basically came on and he, and he talked about his, uh, his difficulties with drink and, um, he talked about his daughters were there. I think he had two daughters, um, and, um, his wife or his first wife was there. Um, and one thing that was Esther asked, I remember this, and uh, she said to him, what if, it, what if you hadn't have liked drink? And he said, if I hadn't have liked drink, it would have been something else because I have an addictive personality. So he'd obviously gone through sort of a thought process of, of it was partly his he just had an addictive personality uh which um i'm i'm slightly workaholic and i get up early and all the rest of it but i don't really have that addictive personality i don't particularly like drink i i don't gamble um but there are people who who do and and mike recognized that, that he um uh, he was one of them um but we were really thrilled in uh, in a in a personal way to to have been invited onto his show, and I later discovered that several people turned it down, and there's actually only me and Janet uh, uh, had agreed to do it. Don't know why. I mean, um, maybe maybe they thought. Who, anyway, who knows what they thought? But me and Janet did it, and we were, and it was lovely to see him again. And actually, he got me to do. I can't remember whether I did it live on the show or whether I did it backstage. I think I did it backstage. He said, "Steve, Steve." Do your Alan Bennett. I love your Alan Bennett. And that was the generosity of the man that 
at, at that stage in his mm. life he wanted to hear other people's impressions mm. not his own and and that's sort and to me that that sort of generosity is 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 i've never forgotten that and i'd love to see him again i i you know i i don't he's in his 70s now but um i'd, I'd love to see him again mm. <laughs> He was also on that show with Bob Monkhouse, wasn't he? Looking back at comedy, was that the one? Yeah. 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 Um, but he was. That, those, I think, were were a vague recollection of that. But that was a sort of retrospective, as the Esther show was a, a retrospective. But it, he didn't really do any impersonations on the Esther show. I think he just wanted to. Um, go on and and you know open up about his life and 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 sort of say look this is what happened to me um, which is always a, a very good thing to do because it, you know it helps um, you know other people that are watching to you know, be honest and and open up about stuff um, but I don't think he's he, the, uh, when I chatted to people who worked with him he yes he drank a lot but he his drinking wasn't destructive and he wasn't unpleasant when he drank. Uh, it was just that it, it, he had a, he had a need for it in a way because he was so nervous. I mean, that's the thing that struck me most really about working with him was how nervous he was, uh, particularly about the prospect of going in front of an audience. Um, whereas actually, you, you know, you, 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 uh, people like Bruce Forsyth, you can't, you know, they can't wait to get on the stage. Ken Dodd can't wait, you know, he couldn't wait to get on the stage. Uh, and, and Bob Monkhouse as well, but 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 you know, because Mike was such a shy sort of character, that wasn't he wasn't eager to get on the stage. He he found it he needed a a friend to the drink um, to to get him onto the stage. Yeah. Anyway, you you use of that what you will. I mean, I I I loved the man. I think he was. Um, he was a very generous performer. Uh, he, 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 you could see his family loved him. His two daughters absolutely adored him, um, and uh, he's well thought of. You know, I meant I talked to Rory Bremner. You talked to Lewis McLeod. You talked to John Coleshaw. Um, we all speak of him with great affection. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was great. Oh, right. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your memories and everything. <laughs> well, it's. Um, are you 